It is Monday, July 2nd, 2018. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And it was a very, very educational get your ass kicked at Jiu Jitsu Monday. Um, I, I have had this perpetual struggle, and I, I really had a. Um, kind of a slap in the face to to remind me of it and uh you know it kind of it kind of all locked in really you know i've i've been having this this struggle as as all of you who listen regularly know um where i tend to be really pressure oriented with my my uh, jujitsu and um i i want to work it into a more subliminal kind of thing like you know the pressure has a purpose like i'm i'm holding you a certain way because you know i'm i'm really reaching for your arm and you know i'm gonna explode in just a moment and and have your arm trapped and 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 arm bar you you know that kind of thing and um i'm just not there yet you know it's like everybody figures out really quick what i'm going for i've only managed it one time where I really had a good side control on this guy. He figured out that I was going for the Americana. So I backed off. And I I went for something else. And as soon as I felt his hand get up to where I could reach up and grab it, it, it happened. You know, he put his hand on my shoulder. I reached up, grabbed his wrist, threw him in an Americana, done and done. But... I haven't been able to get that subliminal with my game. You know, it's like I'm, I'm really kind of obvious with it. But I'll, I'll admit, um, despite the fact that I did recently get my blue belt, um, it took a lot of me- mental preparation for me to get there. You know, because the fact of the matter is, is I, I'm still kind of kind of injured still. You know, I'm still getting a lot of, little, a lot of weird aches and pains in that region of my arm. And... Uh, and you know, usually after a good roll, <laughs> so I'm I'm not I'm not out of the woods with regard to that yet, and I I really haven't been putting as much emphasis on, you know, grabbing and and holding with my hand per se, because that's really where my forearm gets gets kind of fucked up. But anyway, as far as like what we covered today, um, and, and what brought it all together for me, um. I'm going to take a step back and just say that this weekend I had a very, very rare, very rare pleasure happen in 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 my jujitsu dojo. Um, a Mr. Mike DeWitt showed up. Now, for those of you who are in the Northwest, you know that Mr. DeWitt runs Tenth Planet Jujitsu in Springfield, not not very far away from from where we're at now. And um, so he shows up in a gi, or with a gi, you know. And this this is a guy that the tenth planet is gi-less. There's no gis involved. And what I surmise to have happened is this gentleman went to the jujitsu summit. They gave him a gi as you know reward for showing up because that was like one of the things is they gave all, all the participants a gi. Which I, I really wanted to go just so I could get the free gi out of it, honestly, because they're really nice gis. So anyway, um, he shows up, and I, I recognize him right off the bat. Shake his hand. Hey, man, thank you very much for showing up. What are you doing here? You know. And so he, um, he wanted to come and do some open mat with us. And uh, there was me and uh, two other gentlemen that are, that regularly train, and then. I didn't know it, but there was one of the gentlemen that regularly trains at 10th Planet there, in addition to Mr. DeWitt. And so, I rolled with the other gentleman from from 10th Planet, and then uh, and then towards the end, he was going to roll with, with Mike. He, he'd already rolled with him a couple times, but um, I hadn't had an opportunity to, to roll with Mike. And so, you know, it's like, well, I'd like to roll with you, you know. <laughs> And so, yeah, he's like, yeah, come on, man. Very welcoming, very... The guy's uh, the the best gentleman so far that I think I've run into jiu-jitsu. And, I mean, I, I feel like I was almost just a tad disrespectful, but, you know, I mean, come on, man, it's my gym. <laughs> if 
but uh, anyway, I mean, I didn't like, you know, be like bad or anything, but, you know, I mean, it was just amazing to me to have that opportunity. You know, this guy is not, no joke. The guy is no joke. You know, he, he could have, look, he, he was watching the timer the whole time and just playing with me. And I came down to like, you know, 30 seconds into this or, or so. It might have taken a little bit longer for me to figure it out. But he tapped me like, pff, I don't know, six, six, seven times within five minutes. And, and you know, I mean, he's a fucking black belt. What do you expect, you know? But what struck me about it is his grips were very, very crisp. And this is a gentleman, to my knowledge, who does not regularly train in a gi. So it's like he had the grips down. You know, it's like, wow. You know, it's like this must be like a return to the gi for him, you know. Um, but anyway, it was an extreme pleasure, an extreme honor. I, I've got to say, both gentlemen were were um, consummate sportsmen, and uh, yeah, I, I felt in good hands the entire time. But nonetheless, I felt like I was pretty much dead at their <laughs> at their leisure the entire time. So, you know, it's it's obvious to me that they're uh, they're very very good. Um, but anyway, um, the associate that was with Mr. DeWitt, I, I, I can't remember his name for the life of me, but anyway, he had said something to me. He's like, yeah, you got really good pressure. You know, so, and, and, and that's something that I've always heard about my jiu-jitsu in response from other people is that, you know, I've got a really good pressure game. You know, okay, that's, that's wonderful. I want more fucking technique to stick between my ears and come out of my fucking hands and my legs. And it's it's just I'm having a lot of trouble with that, you know. And so, you know, but like he said that, and, and you know, I I took it as a compliment, you know. I mean, the guy is really really good. And so, I mean, for him to say anything like that to me again, I'm very honored. Um, but nonetheless, so today comes around, and um, there's something that happens if I'm away from jujitsu for any time more than like. 24 hours there's just like this switch goes off in my head where most of it gets deleted or overwritten or whatever jumbled and so i get back in jiu-jitsu today and we were covering some uh, some baseball bat chokes from side control and um i really i blew this because i had an opportunity i had a um a partner in the last um the last role session where I had him, like, dominant-wise, I mean, weight dominance, I had him, shit, I, I think I'm, like, six inches taller than him, and about probably somewhere between 50 and 70 pounds heavier than him, you know, I mean, just, like, I really felt like I was, I was hurting him. Anyway, um, he, he kept making these weird mistakes with his arms, and and so like I would trap his arm between me and him and I was trying to get it to one arm and the the problem was I reached over with the wrong arm if I had reached over with the other arm I I would have I would have had him pretty securely or if I had grabbed my own lapel over his neck then then I would have had him pretty securely Um, but anyway like I said, I, I had him physics wise, and I blew the opportunity to apply the uh, apply the lessons that we were learning in in class. Because I mean, he again, he he wasn't a real threat to me. You know, if he if he were to have gotten me into an armbar position or something, I know that I could get out. I, if he were to be getting me in a choke position, I I know I could get out. It's just I'm physically superior enough that I, I think I could get him unless he just like caught me on a completely qu- complete weird thing I think that technique wise I'm probably a little better than him as well so anyway um I got kind of talked to by one of my um one of my compatriots in the gym at, at the end he, and he's like so how are you feeling about your jiu-jitsu and I'm like well how did it look because he, he was watching me and he's like well you know i for for somebody that was thirty to forty pounds lighter than you, it looked okay. But you you definitely could have taken him with technique. And you know, I uh, I really internalized that, and I felt bad for as much pressure as I was putting on my uh, my opponent because you know I did. 
But nonetheless, it is jiu-jitsu. It's not, it's not ballet. You know, these, these things are a factor in jiu-jitsu. I would just like to get to a point where I'm not as reliant on them, you know? It is with that, I want to go ahead and get us into some music. Um, yeah, I, I'm, my apologies to my opponent if I was too rough or, or if I was putting too much pressure on you. But, you know, I mean, there, there are things you can do to kind of, you know, do things like get a bridge or something. You know, because, I don't know, it's, it's jujitsu. You know, I mean, you, the guy is smaller than me, but, you know, you can just as easily push out from under the pressure, too. You know, I, I'm really good at containment, but I'm not impervious to it. You know, you, you can get around me. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some music. And I think this has got to be it. We're going to open it up with a little bit of body count. Because from what I understand, I believe they are still on their their European tour. Or they might just be cutting that leg and coming back to the U.S. Actually, I think that's it. I follow... Uh, I follow Ice T on Twitter, and I'm pretty sure he's coming back and doing rap. But we're gonna open it up with body count because I like body count. Talk shit, get shot. First dance here on Coin Metal, and that was Crowbar with "I Am Forever." It was really funny because the computer actually picked Kingdom of Sorrow to follow that up with, but. Alas, we're not going to do music all night. Well, periodically, of course. You guys know all this, right? Anyway, I do have several tabs open in the old browser that I recovered from the ever trusty Twitter sphere. And uh, crypto Twitter is certainly a light today. A little bit of a. Uh, Happy sentiment going on out there. Bitcoin's bubbling along a little bit today. Bitcoin cashes as well. I like that. I like it a lot. Anyway, um, like I said, I got several tabs open here. And I'm not exactly sure which route I want to go first. Only because there's so much good stuff out there. Let's go with... Bank of Finland, but first we're going to verify the source. Yes, good. Oh, let's see here. Oh, this is Coin Telegraph's stuff, but this is on the Bitcoin News. Uh, I just had to verify that this is actually the entire article because there's there's some aggregators where they'll only put like the first like paragraph maybe two paragraphs and then they'll be like oh yeah this is the source for it like, mother because now you got to open another tab and you know, more bullshit fuck all that anyway yeah like i said it looks like uh looks like the markets have been chirping a little happier song as of late <clears throat> but i got this article here on the bitcoin news.com Bank of Finland releases scathing crypto report, calls digital currency a quote-unquote fallacy. Uh, this is author July 2nd, 2018. And uh, you know what? We're going to right-click on their, their fucking report. And and I just want to check and verify it really quick. Digital assets. Okay, yeah, that's wonderful rights. Um... Where is the paper? Where is the paper? Download the full. Yeah, there we go. Oh, cool. It's 18 pages. It's perfectly digestible in one sitting. But you know what? That, that's exactly what we're going to do. Despite everything else I've got open in it, and I've got some really good stuff open in there, we're going to give this thing a wing in a whirl because, I, you know, I'm... I'm it's it's the first hour. We could easily get through eighteen pages during that time. Cause we got until eleven, so let's fucking do it. Bank of Finland, BOF Economics Review, The Great Illusion of Digital Currencies by Alexi Grimm, Bank of Finland. Abstract. 
This paper is an analysis of digital currencies, including cryptocurrencies and their potential as monetary instruments. The analysis shows that the concept of digital currency is a fallacy. Currency in the form of coins and banknotes can be viewed, viewed as a physical representation of a monetary unit of account. Currency cannot be digitized as this would inevitably mean creating a financial record keeping system based on accounts. Cryptocurrencies are not currencies at all, but accounting systems for non-existent assets. Central bank digital currency would practically mean bank accounts at the central bank. Whether the general public should have access to such accounts, whether the monetary transactions should be allowed to be made anonymously or privately are questions of policy and unrelated to cryptocurrencies or their underlying technology. Hmm, I think this dude's full of shit, but we're going to give him his chance. <clears throat> BOF Economics Review consists of analytical studies on monetary policy, financial markets, and macroeconomic developments. Articles are published in Finnish, Swedish, or English. Previous knowledge of this topic may be required from the reader. 1. Introduction Recent advances in digital technology have spurred a transformation in the global financial industry. Consumer behavior with regards to payments and other financial activities in the change in, in is changing and service providers including banks have been challenged by new market entrants. Among the many innovations in this area, digital currencies have become of keen interest for both the general public as well as financial institutions. A famous example of this class of innovations is Bitcoin, which has also been the template for so-called cryptocurrencies, other so-called cryptocurrencies. The public interest in Bitcoin has init was initial has been initially stimulated by stories of its potential to become a new global form of money. Acting as monetary authorities in their respective countries, central banks around the world have taken note of this phenomenon and started to investigate the plausibility of the many assertions regarding Bitcoin and digital currencies in general. And um, on that note, I would like to add that Bitcoin has functioned as a global currency since around 2011, 2012, as a, as a currency valued in, in uh, fiat currency. Continuing on, as of today, the fundamental nature of digital currencies remains surprisingly elusive. On the one hand, it shows how poorly understood the concept of money itself still is today. On the other hand, it may be reflecting how the World Wide Web and social media have muddled our sense of fact and fiction. There is also the challenge that the expertise required to understand a sophisticated innovation in computer science such as Bitcoin is quite different from the expertise required to understand how some of the fundamental features of our economy, such as money, work. This paper is an attempt at demuddling our understanding of digital currencies and of money in general. I argue that the concept of digital currency is essentially a fallacy. My, my argument rests on the observation that digital currencies are actually account-based ledger systems and not significantly different from other financial record keeping technology. They include some specific innovation, innovative features including related to cryptography and distributed computing, but these are implementation details which are unrelated to the fundamental characteristics of money. And dude, th this is where you lose me because you do not take into account in this base analysis here the fact that digital currencies such as Bitcoin are the result of 
people actually committing hardware and electricity and bandwidth to work. The work of processing all the transactions happening on the network. Continuing on. Previous research on digital currencies. I will use these terms digital currencies and cryptocurrencies interchangeably. I see cryptocurrencies as a special case of digital currencies. The term cryptocurrency came about with Bitcoin as it was the first to utilize cryptographic digital signatures to validate transactions. Cryptocurrencies are the class of digital currencies that has grown immensely in recent years and that growth is probably the main reason for the recent surge in research and public debate on the nature of digital currencies. Although digital currency is a more general concept than cryptocurrency, I am not aware of digital currencies other than cryptocurrencies that would have any real significance in the world today. It is nonetheless important to generalize the analysis to digital currencies because these could, at least in principle, include digital currencies issued by central banks. And this is, no. See, you're t- you're actually remodeling here, dude. Because a digital currency issued by the Federal Reserve isn't mined by a fucking network of 20,000 fucking miners distributed all over planet Earth. It's waved into the fucking existence with the wand of the fucking Federal Reserve. And no, it is not the same as a cryptocurrency. A proof-of-work cryptocurrency is not the same as a digital currency issued by a private bank. Asshole. Continuing. There are many good descriptions of the history of Bitcoin and how the Bitcoin system works, and I will therefore not repeat them here, because God forbid I should give you any fucking context as to what Bitcoin actually is. In what follows, I briefly review some of the academic literature on cryptocurrencies. Your Mac 2013 is the only paper I know of which directly addresses the question of whether cryptocurrencies are money, and it is one of the earliest academic papers on cryptocurrencies. The paper concludes that cryptocurrencies do not perform the functions of money to such a degree that they could be considered monetary instruments. (laughs) No, that was defined by one dude, and you're another dude defining it again. The question isn't whether or not cryptocurrencies can be money it's the question is whether you consider them to be money other people consider them to be money they work as money for other people but not necessarily you not necessarily yet some of the earliest studies on cryptocurrencies were conducted by central banks who gives a fuck what a central bank thinks of fucking cryptocurrency it's direct competition with them The ECB 2012 provides an overview of virtual currencies such as those used within gaming environments and considers cryptocurrencies one subclass among them. Well, that's why your perception of them is all fucked up, dipshit. ECB 2015 is a follow-up study which provides a more detailed descriptive analysis and concludes that cryptocurrencies do not constitute money or currency to you. Badev and Chen, 2014, is the earliest publication by the Federal Reserve Board on the topic. The paper avoids defining Bitcoin, but provides a thorough analysis on its technical architecture and its transactional patterns. Ali et al., 2014, is the first publication by the Bank of England on the topic and provides a conceptual overview of cryptocurrencies. The paper paper refers to cryptocurrencies as money and as currency, but also points out some key differences between cryptocurrencies and real money. Bitcoin has a well-functioning secondary market. Beck and Ebeck, or I'm sorry, Elbeck, 2014, analyzed the market price of Bitcoin and conclude that Bitcoin is best described as a speculative investment vehicle. Um, 
Chung et al. 2015 also analyze the market price of Bitcoin and conclude that its price trajectory features bubbles. Yeah, that's because it's... Uh, I, I'm not going to go into that. Not yet, anyway. Um, let's see. Uh, che and Fry, 2015, also study the price trajectory of Bitcoin. They conclude that the price of Bitcoin exhibits bubbles and that its fundamental value is zero. Yeah, to you, asshole. Balsillier et al. 2017 investigates whether trading volumes can predict market returns for Bitcoin. Their results are mixed. Urquhart 2016 tests whether the market for Bitcoin is efficient and finds that it is not. It's not intended to be. Katsiampa 2017 seeks to find the best economic model for dis describing the volatility of the price of Bitcoin. Um, Bori et al. 2017 explore the ability of Bitcoin to function as a hedging instrument and some find evidence for this. Glassier et al. 2014 has studied bit the Bitcoin user community and finds strong evidence that the demand for Bitcoin is primarily driven by its use as a speculative instrument, investment instrument, rather than a currency. Actually, it's both. Similar findings have been reported by Bayek and Elbeck, 2014, Katsiampa, 2017, and Dwyer, 2015. Yeah, you know what? All of these fucking ignore you as an aspect of the market. They don't understand that, it, that Bitcoin has any kind of value because you demand it. If you had no demand for it, you would not use it, whether it is a speculative instrument to you or if it's fucking money to you. Continuing on, and that that part was not in in this paper. Let's see. Katsiampa, two thousand seventeen, and Dwyer, two thousand fifteen, Yellowwitz and Wilson, two thousand fifteen, apply a different methodology and find evidence that interest in Bitcoin is associated with interest in computer programming and illegal activity. Of course, that's that's the media's impression of us. Foley et al. 2018 investigate Bitcoin transactions and find that a large portion of transactions and users are related to illegal activity, i.e. making money without paying anybody else to do it. Borum et al. 2015 provide a descriptive analysis of the Bitcoin system, its market, and its governance structure. The paper compares the supply of Bitcoin to the supply of money and refers to Bitcoin as a currency, but does not explain the choice of terminology. Dwyer 2015 and Selgin 2015 also analyze various broader aspects of the Bitcoin system. Both assume that Bitcoin is a currency without providing further explanation for that assumption. Huberman et al. 2017 say the economic incentive structure of the Bitcoin network and find, uh, I'm sorry, study the economic incentive structure of the Bitcoin network and find that congestion is necessary for its continuous, continuous operation. No, actually, it's not. They describe Bitcoin as a system of accounts. Howman and Rocks 2017 provide rich empirical data on the industry that has sprung up around cryptocurrencies. It is highly a highly descriptive study which avoids making assumptions and assertions that aren't supported by evidence. One of the many findings in the paper is that cryptocurrencies are primarily used as a speculative investment instrument. You know, you know why that it appears that way? is because versus the fiat currencies that they're valued against, they are not being waved into existence by the billions by a central bank. If anyone holds any cryptocurrency for any duration of time, there's a significant chance that it will actually increase in value in the selected fiat currency of their nation state in the time that they are actually holding it. Does that make it a speculative investment? Or does it mean it was used very, very smartly by the user themselves. Personally, having experienced it myself, 
I'd say the latter. Number three, again, what is money? 3.1, the neoclassical definitions of money. The economic literature is rich in definitions and discussions on the nature of money. Many writers have tried to formulate a definition which would stand the test of time and would apply to all the different forms that money has taken over the course of the millennium. It is inescapable, however, that any such definition will only reflect the realities known up to that point in time. Kinda. Kiyotaki and Wright, 1989, have developed a widely cited economic model where money emerges endogeneously as a medium of exchange. Their definition of money follows a long and pervasive tradition in the economic literature according to which money, usually interpreted as a physical good, exists to facilitate trade and to make barter exchange more efficient. Based on that premise, Kiyotaki and Wright 1989 define money and clarify the difference between commodity and fiat money as follows. Quote, when a commodity is accepted in trade not to be consumed or used in production, but to be used to facilitate further trade, it becomes a medium of exchange and it is call, uh, called commodity money. If an object with no intrinsic value becomes a medium of exchange, it is called fiat money. <clears throat> What is common to most definitions in the literature is that money is defined based on what it does and not what it is. This could mean that anything could can be money as long as it is used in a certain way. In addition to functioning as a medium of exchange, money is widely seen as also having the functions of store of value and unit of account. Store of value implies that money is an asset. It should retain its approximate value over time so that its owner can get a similar utility from it at a later date. Kynes, 1936, and Samuelson, 1958, emphasize that this intertemporal nature of money, oh, I'm sorry, emphasize this intertemporal nature of money. According to their view, money is used to preserve purchasing power across time to exchange present goods for future goods. Medium of exchange means something which is accepted in exchange solely for the reason that it can be later traded for other goods and services. A medium of exchange is necessary also as a store of value, but not vice versa. An object which is easily transported, durable, divisible, easily recognized, and assayed has the potential to become a medium of exchange. Historical examples include stones, cereal, metal objects, animal skins, and shells. Medium of exchange is sometimes confused with means of payment. Yang, 2007 demonstrates that the difference between the two con uh, differences between the two concepts while a medium of exchange refers to an asset which people regularly exchange for other goods and services means of payment refers to generally accepted methods for the delivery of money the difference is that a medium of exchange is in itself an asset of value while a means of payment is not Yang 2007 exemplifies this by noting the, that banknotes are a medium of exchange, while checks are not. Both, however, are a means of payment. According to his view, cash is the only asset which is both a medium of exchange and a means of payment. However, on that point, with regard to Bitcoin, <laughs> It's, uh, who determines what cash is, is the user. Continuing on. Unit of account can be defined as a general metric for value, 
Dope Key and Snyder 2017 define it as the good in which the value of future payments is specified. Unit of account literally implies that it is the metric used in bookkeeping. Prices can be quoted in many units, but only one of them is the unit of account for the producer of that good or service. This follows from the fact that the producer has to pay for inputs, including wages and salaries, and pay out taxes and dividends. There is therefore an inherent connection between accounting units and prices. Money as a unit of account is reflecting the ratio at which various goods can be traded into other goods. Doki and Schneider 2017 show that it is optimal to use the same unit of account on both sides of the balance sheet in order to mitigate risks. Yeah, <laughs> there are risks, all right. <clears throat> McClay et al. 2014 and Ollie et al. 2014 describe the functions of money as hierarchical. According to their view, not every store of value is a medium of exchange, and not every medium of exchange is a unit of account. But every unit of account is a medium of exchange, and every medium of exchange is a store of value. While this is an intuitive idea, Neither paper presents any empirical support for it. <laughs> yeah, that's because they can't. Graber shows 2011. Well, Graber 2011 shows that the idea may have little or no historical basis. That it's because it doesn't account for the bank inflating the number of units beyond the ability to account for them, meaning without assets to back them up. 3.2. Liquidity and Currency Liquidity is a property of any good or asset that refers to the ease of selling it. A highly liquid asset can be exchanged into other goods and services easily and at low cost. Many definitions of money, including those by Jevons, 1875, Menger, 1892, Brenner and Meltzer, 1971 expressed the idea that the most liquid good in the economy is used as money. Kynes 1936, Diamond and Dybvig 1983, among others, use liquidity as a synonym for money. I don't. Star 2003 has developed a general equilibrium model where out many goods in the economy the one that has that is the most liquid as defined as having the lowest transaction costs becomes the generally accepted medium of exchange uh, yeah Australian star 19, 1988 summarized the idea as follows what distinguishes money from other stores of value is its liquidity and under un, and what underlies the liquidity of money is the fact that it is the common medium through which other commodities are exchanged. Let's try that one again. What distinguishes money from other stores of value is its liquidity and what underlies the liquidity of money is the fact that it is the common medium through which other commodities are exchanged. Mm. Uh, no. No, no. Currency refor refers to money in circulation. In other words, it is physical money which is passed on from one owner to another without going through intermediaries. It is also widely used and generally accepted as payment and to settle debts within a certain geographic or economic community. Oh my god, he just... Re Dude, he just recognized it right there! Okay, the exclusivity of those who are willing to use it as a currency. So it doesn't matter what the fuck he has to say about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. He understands that he's not within the community that accepts them as currency by defining that anyway continuing on this definition implies that money is a broader concept than currency and that currency is a special case a special case of money 
Practically speaking, currency is synonymous to coins and banknotes. According to the theory presented by Menger in 1892 and many others since, money emerged out of existing stores of value as the one that was the most liquid and was able to facilitate transactions, thereby making the exchange of goods and services more efficient. I would say possible at all. There are two reasons for this efficiency gain. First, using a medium of exchange reduces the number of transactions required to arrive at an optimal allocation of resources. Second, using a single unit of account reduces the information and transaction costs in those transactions. These can be explained as follows. I would say a premium elected on by the exchanger. In an economy with n agents, there are n times n minus 1 divided by 2 possible trading opportunities between any two agents. This number reduces to n1 transactions when money is used. This is the efficiency argument for a medium of exchange. In an economy with n commodities and no money, there are n times n minus 1 divided by 2 different exchange ratios for different commodity pairs. This number reduces to n, n minus 1 prices when money is used. This is the efficiency argument for a unit of account. If these, two, if these were two different objects, there would exist one more exchange ratio, the one between the medium of exchange and the unit of account. If the same object functions as both, its exchange ratio disappears and efficiency is further improved. Yeah, like Bitcoin. 3.3. Money is a unit of account. What is apparent in many of the neoclassical definitions of money is the emphasis on physical currency. This is in contrast to the fact that the greatest part of money today, and possibly throughout history, has been in the form of account balances on financial ledgers, i.e. scriptural money. It would be easy to conjecture that widely, a widely used medium of exchange also becomes used as a unit of account. This is because the value of any good or asset is ultimately tested by selling it. It is also more efficient to use the same asset as both a medium of exchange and as a unit of account. Graeber 2011 shows, however, that money has actually evolved the other way around. Money first appeared as an accounting unit for the purpose of record keeping. Goods were valued and priced in these units, and only later did some of those goods become used as mediums of exchange. One could therefore argue that money is always scriptural. scriptural and that money is inherently a unit of account. Currency in the form of coins, banknotes, or other physical objects can be seen as a physical manifestation of the unit of account. Physical currency would then be just another way to keep accounts, a more tangible form of bookkeeping, i.e. for off-chain transacting. Out of these three basic functions of for money, therefore it is the unit of account that is arguably the most fundamental. Diagram 1 illustrates the three basic elements of financial record keeping, accounts, transactions, and a unit of account. In the case of scriptural money, accounts are held in books or on computers at a bank. An account entry is a record of some asset. An account entry without a corresponding asset would be meaningless. However, banks had them on their side all the time. Each account has a balance which is expressed in the unit of account. Transactions are recorded in, in a journal and account balances are adjusted accordingly. In the case of physical currency, accounts are maintained individually by each person. A purse or a wallet is effectively a cash account, much as your Bitcoin wallet is. The contents of such a purse is the balance of that account. A transaction takes place when, one, when some units of account, i.e. currency, 
are physically transferred from one purse to another, or digitally in the, in the way of Bitcoin. The balances on each account adjust accordingly. There is thus no conceptual difference between a bank account and a cash purse, as long as they consist of the same elements. <clears throat> Diagram 1, balance, blah, 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 balance, blah, 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 okay, whatever. The handling of physical objects to keep accounts is simple and intuitive and therefore still widely used today. This is consistent with empirical research on the use of cash recently conducted by Eisenlink, I'm sorry, Essenlink and Hernandez 2017. They find that the main reason why cash is the preferred, pre preferred payment instrument among consumers in the Eurozone is that, quote, it gives a clear overview of expenses. In other words, cash has an accounting function in addition to a payment function. It is the combination of these two functions that makes cash so compelling. And the fact that the central bank that issues them can devalue them right out from under you, which makes holding them not all that compelling anymore. The theory of money as a unit of account is not new, but it is it has not been the dominant narrative in the economic literature. Kocher Lakota to 1998 is one of the few papers few papers <clears throat> which builds on the idea. It presents a theoretical model where currency primarily functions as a financial record-keeping device. The paper demonstrates that any resource allocation which can be attained using a medium of exchange can also be attained using financial record-keeping. 3.4 A Brief Remark on Money Creation and Price Stability Money in today's world is created by the banking system as a whole. One can distinguish between central bank money and... You know what? Let's take a break really quick here. We're at 3.4 on uh, page 17, and this is... Um, shit. I found it from uh, the Bitcoin News. Uh, bank, of, bank of Finland releases scathing crypto report calls digital currency a fallacy. Um, we're actually reading that report now. We're on page 7 of 18, 3.4 brief remark on money creation and price stability. And we will be going right back to that as soon as we get back from this music break. But I would like to take a, a, a brief music break here. So, what to put on? Um, let's try a little Lamb of God here. Um, footprints here on Coin Metal. If we haven't broken our program here. And that was sixth with Vivid. <clears throat> I tell you what, we do not have enough sixth. As a matter of fact, uh, my, my next album purchase, I'm going to like stock up on sixth. Because their music is, is really, really, I, I feel very, very unique in, in that it's it's highly chaotic, but it's extremely skilled. These guys are consummate musicians. I mean, they, they put together some awesome composition, and uh, I want more of it on the show. That's all there is to it. Anyway, <coughs> let's go ahead and get back into this bad boy. If I can find the damn tab that has it in it. Let's see, where is it? There, no. No. Uh, no, there it is. All right, three point four. A brief remark on money creation and price stability. Money in today's world is created by the banking system as a whole. One can distinguish between central bank money and commercial bank money. The former generally exists in two forms: cash and reserve accounts. Both types of central bank money are liabilities on the balance sheet of a central bank. In other words, IOUs. Reserves can only be held by commercial banks at the central bank, while cash can be held by any person or entity. The central bank can create new money, 
by lending to commercial banks or by purchasing assets from them. Commercial banks can create new money through lending and house uh, lending to households and businesses. Money as credit has been the subject of debate for more than a century. Whether or not all money should be viewed as credit is not the subject of this paper. I refer to Innis 1914, Skaggs 1998, Ray 2014, or McLee 2014 for discussions on this topic. Cash can further exist in two different forms, coins and banknotes. These have become equivalent, but they have different historical origins. Early deposit banks took coins as deposits and made account entries to record those deposits. Banknotes were effectively receipts for the deposits and later started circulating as currency in place of the deposited coins. When a modern bank issues money in the form of an account entry, it commits to exchanging that money into banknotes. Modern banknotes are not redeemable for any specific asset, but they are generally accepted as payment for goods or services. When new money is created in the form of loans, whether by central banks or commercial banks, it is largely backed by collateral that they say they have. Therefore, money is not created out of thin air, but rather as a result of liquidity transformation. Less liquid assets such as rent-yielding real estate, dividend-yielding equity, or interest-yielding bonds are pledged as collateral against monetary loans. Gaffney 2009 provides a thorough analysis of this mechanism. Even though modern fiat money is not backed by any specific underlying asset such as gold, it is backed by what central banks call price stability. Uh, often pursued by a policy of inflation targeting. Price stability means stability in the general price level, not any one place in particular. Price stability as a policy goal effectively means that money retains its value relative to all goods and services. <sighs> <clears throat> Since under price stability the value of money is generated relative to all goods and services, it is arguably a stronger form of backing than backing against a single commodity. Whether or not a central bank is able to deliver on that guarantee is a separate question, but it is worth pointing out that a similar credibility concern applies regardless of whether the monetary system is, price, is based on price stability or, commodity, or a commodity standard. 4. Can such a thing as digital currency exist? Yes. 4.1. A closer look at cryptocurrencies. In light of recent developments in digital technology, the theory of money as a unit of account is the one that best fits the entire span of historical evidence, starting from, from the prehistoric era to the present day. In what follows, I examine digital currencies in this context and argue that the concept of digital currency is questionable. When currency is viewed as a physical representation of a monetary unit of account, then turning that currency into digital form simply means using the same unit of account in financial records. Damn skippy. I will below describe the functional principles of cryptocurrencies and use Bitcoin as a representation, representative example. There are over a thousand other cryptocurrencies in existence today, but Bitcoin is by far the largest and most popular, and it is also the template for most of the rest. It is helpful to follow the thinking of Nakamoto 2008 and to work out step by step how one would arrive at a cryptocurrency system given its objectives. <clears throat> the goal of Nakamoto was to create a new type of payment system that would allow sending money online from one party to another without using intermediaries. The payment system would be similar to cash in the sense that payments would be direct 
anonymous, and irreversible. Nakamoto attempted to do this by introducing the concept of digital coins. It is a confusing choice of terminology since in reality there is nothing representing coins in the Bitcoin system. Instead, at the core of the Bitcoin system, the system are transactions. A transaction is a data entry with three pieces of information, a sender, a recipient, and the amount being transferred. The sender and the recipient are identified by account numbers which in Bitcoin are represented by public keys. The amount, is, the amount transferred is expressed by using a fungible unit of account. This unit of account was supposed to represent money. Bitcoin keeps records of transactions in strict chronological order, not necessarily. In Bitcoin, this, is, this record is called a blockchain. This is equivalent to a journal in, the tr in a traditional, in traditional accounting terminology. The essential record keeping mechanism, therefore, including the concept of a transaction and a fungible unit of account, is no different from ledger books that have been used for hundreds of years or more. With the exception of this, it's being held by thousands and thousands of people all over the world. It's not a ledger that's only held by a bank and its grouping of people. And, it's, and the results that are recorded in it are the result of the work of that network. <laughs> anyway, continuing on. Typically, the task of financial record keeping would be that of a bank. For Nakamoto, however, the objective was to avoid banks. Bitcoin is therefore implemented as a peer-to-peer -peer network. This means that there is an unspecific, uh, unspecified number of volunteers who jointly perform the task of an account. But in, in Bitcoin, these accounts are called confusingly miners. For each transaction, one of the miners is randomly chosen as the one who records the transaction in the ledger. It's not random. As a reward, the miner is allowed to retain a transaction fee paid by the sender and Bitcoin that are issued at the end of the block. Nakamoto's solution of randomly assigning an unidentified intermediary is sometimes erroneously interpreted as using no intermediary at all. But an intermediary is always used and all transactions are necessarily recorded in a single ledger. Yeah, held by everybody, fucking ass. For all intents and purposes, that ledger is a centralized ledger distributed all over the planet, which makes it kind of decentralized, don't you think? The fact that there are multiple synchronized copies of it distributed across the network is irrelevant, as each one has the same data. The basic principle of operating a ledger to record account balances and transaction is therefore no different from what a bank would do, with the exception that we all have a copy of it instead of just a fucking bank. Therefore, we can all verify whether or not it is actually correct. Duh. The idea of withholding a transaction fee is also no different from how banks would be rewarded from for processing payments. Ah. A challenge for Nakamoto's system was how to ensure that miners don't enter fraudulent transactions into the ledger. This is what Nakamoto referred to as the double spending problem. Double spending is normally avoided by using a single trusted record keeper and by having public institutions oversee the conduct of that record keeper. Nakamoto solved the problem by making the ledger public and by using cryptography and algorithms, the details of which are widely documented and not necessary, not necessary repeating here. To make entering fraudulent transactions very, very expensive. Unless they're happening off-chain in which you have all the time in the fucking world to manipulate the data however you want to and then redistribute the data. 
Another puzzle for Nakamoto was how to enable the system to transfer ownership of money instead of arbitrary units, considering that banks had been specifically excluded from the system. Nakamoto never managed to solve that problem because it cannot be solved. If banks are not involved, the system cannot possibly transfer money. That's bullshit. <clears throat> if we use Bitcoin as money, it can tra be transferred anywhere the fucking network is. Duh. Money as an account entry means a commitment to buy a bank to convert that account entry into something else, whether this is coins, banknotes, or general purchasing power. When there is no bank or other entity making such a commitment, or when the account entry does not refer to any actual deposited asset, the account entry is meaningless. Nakamoto described the role of banks as purely one of processing transactions, but that is an incomplete view as it omits the role of banks as also providing liquidity for the payment system. In other words, counterfeiting money. In order to recreate a fully functional payment system, it is therefore not enough to solve the double spending problem. One also has to solve the question of where the liquidity for the payment system comes from. If there was a bank that would provide the liquidity for the Bitcoin system, then money could be used as a unit of account. But then the purpose of selling it setting it up as a peer-to-peer -peer network would become moot since the bank could itself maintain the ledger and act as the record keeper. The system would be indistinguishable from a core banking system. It would consist of a set of accounts, a unit of account, a ledger, or strictly speaking a journal where all transactions are recorded. And I would like to take a, take a moment to mention that is exactly the intent of the people that are prop big proponents of this Lightning Network business. Is that, y y like, the, the, there's this little thing, and it keeps sticking with me. This little factoid that I heard mentioned in one of the, um, one of the videos talking about Lightning Network was that there was this little feature on there that would allow you to make it to where you didn't even know or didn't even care what node you were using to route your transaction. So then how would you know whether or not Visa is the one that's processing your transaction? I mean, you would have absolutely no idea. They, they could be all of the nodes that are between you and the the end of the transaction whenever that happens. You know, weeks, months, years. We don't know. When it finally goes to the Bitcoin blockchain. <laughs> anyway, continuing on. The only difference between a cryptocurrency system and a traditional ledger system is that, there, that in a cryptocurrency system... The ledger is distributed across a network of computers, while the traditional bank maintains the ledger in a centralized computer system. Actually, that's not entirely true, because uh, he says thereafter, there is, however, no practical difference in what the systems do. That's not true. The, pro the, the participants in the network, the miners, are rewarded for the effort of mining in the coin. That's how the quote-unquote liquidity is issued into the system. Instead of a, a, a central bank waving the magic wand and creating notes that they say they have assets to back, whether or not they actually do, <laughs> instead of that, and, and them having the only ledger and be, having the only way to account for their activities, their, their magic wand waving, we have the record distributed all over the planet, so if somebody tries to wave the magic wand, we all find out about it. And we say, no, you can't have the coins because you waved a fucking magic wand. You cheated. Fuck you. You suck. Continuing on. In summary, digital currency is not currency at all, but a system of accounts. This should not be surprising considering that a computer is fundamentally a record-keeping device similar to a ledger. 
Perhaps it is not even theoretically possible to process financial tra transactions in any other way. Unlike cash, digital currency does not pass from one owner to another without going through intermediaries. The fact that Bitcoin runs on a peer-to-peer -peer network does not mean that transactions on that network would be peer-to-peer. -peer. They are not. Actually, some of them are. The data which comprises a transaction is transmitted, uh, transmitted from the sender to the ledger, not from the sender to the recipient. Cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin are often referred to as digital tokens. Such, uh, uh, not by me. Such a description may be intuitive, but it is fundamentally false. No tokens actually exist. That's not why token is an inappropriate application. Tokens can be the process of a uh, can be the product of a non-mined process. Somebody can wave the magic wand and create a token. Whereas they have to mine a fucking coin. That's just a loose definition in semantics by me. An account balance in a cryptocurrency system makes it look as if the account holder had a claim to the tokens. But since no tokens exist in reality, the claim isn't effective. That's not entirely true. You can make the coins exist in quote unquote reality by creating a paper wallet. And sending the coins to it. You can even verify online that the transaction has taken place. You can verify it by scanning the public address on the wallet and checking it on the blockchain. Continuing on, 4.2. Does Bitcoin have intrinsic value? Yes. The fact that Bit the Bitcoin network is incapable of transferring money created two problems for Nakamoto. On the one, on the one hand, the system failed, uh, fails in its ultimate goal, namely to replace cash, only in your, your account. On the other hand, a peer-to-peer -peer network relies on miners providing compu computing resources in exchange for transfer fees. If the transfers do not consist of money, then neither do the fees, and if the miners don't receive a pecuniary reward, then they have no incentive to operate the, the network. This might seem like an existential problem, but the network did manage to materialize and even grow to substantial proportions. How is that even possible? I explain it as follows, using basic economic concepts. Consider a planner, i.e. Nakamoto, who wants to set up a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer ledger, i.e. Bitcoin. The planner wants the system to operate independently of anyone, and therefore invites miners to join and operate the network in exchange for transfer fees. But, the only fees the planner can offer are Bitcoin units, which have no value. As a solution, the planner suggests that the miners sell for actual money the units they receive as rewards. But who would buy them? Initially, nobody has an incentive to pay anything for them. To solve this problem, the planner suggests to the miners that if they advertise their mining rewards, then perhaps this will generate demand and people will want to buy them. This is more or less what happened. Advertising may not have been explicitly suggested by Nakamoto, and it didn't need to be a co coordinated effort, but anyone who ended up owning Bitcoin units nevertheless had an incentive to advertise them in order to create a secondary market. The advertising message was initially the story of a new global currency, which it was functioning perfectly as. Whether the story was realistic or not is not important. Absolutely it was, because here we are nine years later, dude. As long as it generated demand. As soon as Bitcoin units had willing buyers, it became worthwhile to operate the network since the mining rewards had become sellable goods. Saleable goods. There would be a positive return on investment both to advertising Bitcoin both to advertising Bitcoin and to expanding the computing resources of miners. The investments have since grown to massive proportions. As of today, so much computing power has been invested into the Bitcoin network that it 
its energy consumption exceeds that of many countries. Advertising was initially perhaps inadvertently done by almost anyone enthusiastic about the topic using websites, discussion boards, so social media po posts, online videos, white papers, and media interviews. Eventually it became a more deliberate activity which utilized books, films, and other major marketing channels. Although Bitcoin started out as an intrinsically worthless unit of account, it has gained genuine demand, which is evident in a persistent non-zero market price. It is important to emphasize, however, that this demand has not turned Bitcoin units into money, except for the people that actually use it as money. It is difficult to generalize why people are buying Bitcoin. Evidently, Bitcoin is used for criminal activity. It has also be, uh, become a brand that some consumers feel drawn to, and it may give a sense of belonging to a community. For others, it may give a feeling of security against state oppression, either real or imagined. It seems that many are drawn to Bitcoin because of the thrill of trading. Because these can be genuine, satisfiable needs, it would not be entirely accurate to say Bitcoin doesn't have intrinsic value. Many goods and services such as toys, fashion art, club memberships, or firearms are bought because they provide their owners with in intangible value which may be difficult for others to comprehend. It is also evident that much of the attraction for Bitcoin is related to personal financial gains. <clears throat> Bitcoin is widely advertised as an investment which can give its owner large financial rewards. I don't know who does that, but they're wrong. The rapid increase in the market price of Bitcoin may have reinforced this message, thereby encouraging further demand and creating a market bubble. Since Bitcoin is not a financial security and does not yield any return in itself, any hopes of financial gains are hinging on the continuing rise in its market price. It is clear that such an, an indefinite rise is not possible as it would require an ever-increasing number of new buyers entering the market. Dude, how many fucking buyers do you think are actually involved in the market at this point? I would, I would go so far as to suggest that the entire crypto sphere consists of less than 100 million people. May, maybe a little bit more. But not much. I mean, really. How, how, how much adoption do you, do you really think has gone on? I, I would say, again, you know, maybe 100 million, maybe, two, maybe 200 million tops are actually involved in the cryptocurrency communities at all. And that that's just my perspective. Now you hop that up to a billion. That's that's only four times that. You know, saying it at 250 million people, right? Four times that is one billion people. There are what, like nine billion people on the planet. That would be one out of nine of you. Now, if you contrast that to what the demand would be, it would be about 2.3 of what it is right now. That would mean that everybody that is currently involved would be 2.3 times richer than they currently are right now, and that that's just on raw numbers. You know, there'll, there'll be some some people that sell at the at the peak, or I mean, I sell at the peak, and then there'll be others that buy at the peak, and you know, these things happen. Anyway, continue on, continuing on rather. 4.3 could Bitcoin become a real currency? It already has. There are many people who seem to believe that the Bitcoin story and in its potential to become a real currency. Without doubt, Nakamoto has been successful in incentivizing miners to operate the network. But as I have shown in this paper, they are not operating a payment system, but a ledger with a meaningless unit of account to everybody not involved in the exchange. In what follows, I will conduct two thought experiments in order to assess whether a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin could theoretically become a real currency. The first is a scenario where an existing currency, say the euro, is issued in the form of cryptocurrency alongside bank accounts and cash. 
The second scenario explores the idea of making an existing cryptocurrency, say Bitcoin, the only legal tender in an economy. And, pfft, I, I can tell from your perspectives, dude, that you don't really understand what's going on here, but continuing on. Scenario 1. Euro-denominated cryptocurrency. Suppose a euro-denominated cryptocurrency would be issued and become legal tender alongside existing bank accounts and cash. In practice, this would require that either the central bank or a commercial bank would commit to converting the cryptocurrency into other forms of the euro. Without such commitment, the value of the cryptocurrency could not be kept at, par at parity with cash and account money. Therefore, the issuing bank needs to have complete control of the supply of the cryptocurrency. <clears throat> in other words, the cryptocurrency would be supplied on demand in exchange for other forms of money, the same way as cash is supplied today. If that were the case, then obviously no new cryptocurrency would be created through mining and the purpose of miners would become questionable. There would be no need for the energy-intensive mining process of the Bitcoin system since the issuing bank could simply take over the processing of transactions and maintain the ledger. It is difficult to find any reason why that process should be decentralized or why the ledger should be public. The security and privacy concerns of an open public ledger would be significant while there would be no apparent benefit to the bank. As a result, cryptocurrency accounts would look like ordinary bank accounts and the issuing bank would find it difficult to justify why it should keep both types of accounts. There is no evidence that cryptocurrency technology would bring efficiency gains, cost advantages, or any added value for either the account holders or the bank. It would be an unnecessary burden for the banks to maintain two types of bank accounts based on disparate technologies. This one... What, this, what the author doesn't understand is that he assumes that the bank is the final arbiter of value the central bank, that just because they create the euro, that they are the final arbiter of value. And he is incorrect. The final arbiter of value in cryptocurrencies and in any currency now is you. You decide where you hodl your monetary value and you decide that based on the, the perception of which which cryptocurrency or which currency would be much most beneficial to you. I hold cryptocurrencies, I hold other monetary units, and I do so in proportions that I feel will benefit me the most. And that that's the point I think this guy is missing here, is that the market is the final arbiter of value, i.e. you. You are the market. You say that Bitcoin has value. You say Bitcoin Cash has value. You say Litecoin has value. You say Monero has value. Verge has value. You do these things. And it's no different for, for any of the cryptocurrencies I mentioned or nationally produced fiat currencies through central banks. There's absolutely no difference in that sense. You are the one that puts the value in it. You are the master that makes the grass green here, kids. And so his observation that it would be unnecessary burden for banks to maintain two types of bank accounts based on disparate technologies, absolutely. It would be completely unnecessary burden for banks to do that. It is a completely unnecessary burden for them to do that. We're already doing it for them. We've already created the market. We determine the market value. They make a decision on what they're willing to do as far as an exchange rate is concerned. And I, I think that's the greater point that a lot of people miss about cryptocurrencies is that 
no two parties are committed to honor the current exchange rate on the exchanges. If the two of you look at the exchange that you're about to make and you can see that the exchange rate that you're doing it at isn't necessarily beneficial and you can both anticipate a change in the market coming, you are free to set the exchange rate at which you want to commerce at. You are the market. And this is an advantage that only banks, only legacy financial architectures have been able to do. And now it's at your hands. Everything you read, though, says that it's just the fucking banks and it's just the national governments that have this power. No, no, my friends. You wield the vocal blade of digital finance. It's in your hands now. You are free to poke at the beast as you wish. And we're on page 11 of 18, continuing on. Scenario 2, Bitcoin economy. For this scenario, let us assume Bitcoin would become legal tender by decree in some country or jurisdiction. It's not actually their place to do it, but continuing on. It would be the only monetary unit of account in the economy, and any previous currency along with the central bank issuing it would be abolished. Absolutely unnecessary. It is clear that this scenario is highly unlikely, but since it is a scenario that has been debated in, pu in the public, it is worthwhile analyzing it in detail. Based on how money has historically evolved, one can hypothesize that the likely long-term evolution for the Bitcoin economy. Initially, Bitcoin would represent the entire monetary base of the economy and currency in circulation, similar to early coinage. Because that monetary base would be scarce, much of it would be deposited into banks as reserves. Incorrect? The, the, the same way as coins were deposited into early, early deposit banks. See, I, I think that's what lightning is actually about. <laughs> but it's about getting your coins in, into their deposit bank. Continuing on. Banknotes backed by the, those reserves would be issued and used as currency. It is efficient for reserves to converge into one bank and this would effectively become a central bank, a growing economy would need an increasing amount of cash for transactions, and this would lead to fractional reserve banking. Eventually, Bitcoin backing would be suspended, and monetary policy would become based on inflation targeting instead. Money would become fiat, Bitcoin a pure commodity, and there would no longer be any connection between the two. That is, in fact, I believe, some people's plans. This stylized sequence of events highlights the importance of unit of account as the most fundamental function of money, which what started out as high-powered currency ended up vaulted as reserves and eventually replaced by banknotes and account money. In the end, all that remained of the original monetary base was the unit of account. In which case, most of us involved in crypto to escape that kind of bullshit would start mining our own cryptocurrencies and diverge from the market. Continuing on. The advertised Bitcoin story includes the idea that a fixed, limited supply of Bitcoin units is enough to ensure its non-inflationary value. But the supply of Bitcoin is limited only to the extent that it replaces base currency as the form of coins. As our thought experiment shows, the total supply of money would be extended by banknotes and bank lending. And the alternative to that is making the fucking blocks bigger so that when the miners do their, their cash out, they when they actually cash out, they're not just getting the transaction fees for, 20, uh, for 2,000 to 4,000 transactions, even if they're using SegWit, they're 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 doing like 128,000 transactions. Yeah, that's completely doable on today's hardware. Moore's law, motherfuckers. We've been stuck on one megabyte blocks since 2015. Give me a fucking break. 
As our thought experiment shows, the total supply of money would be extended by banknotes and bank lending. The Bitcoin story doesn't specify how this additional supply would be controlled. Banknotes, yeah, that's because they aren't fucking included in the goddamn Bitcoin story. Fucking assholes. Banknotes are the dominant payment method throughout the world today, and although their use may have declined in some countries, they are by and large not showing signs of becoming unpopular. Uh, yeah. While Bitcoin may have been invented to replace coinage, coins are not the same as banknotes. There is no reason to think there wouldn't be demand for banknotes and the means to supply them also in a Bitcoin economy. Whatever. To summarize, scenario one shows that creating cryptocurrencies does not make sense for any bank because a convertible cryptocurrency would be indistinguishable from ordinary bank accounts. Scenario two is not plausible either because it would effectively mean replacing existing monetary unit with a new unit and then rebuilding all the institutions required to govern it. Actually, we've been building the institutions to govern it already. There is nothing to suggest that the hypothesized setup would be an improvement compared to the monetary institutions that we have today. On that, I would agree, because the trajectory he describes is pretty much what Lightning Network is. As of today, and contrary to how Bitcoin is advertised, cryptocurrency is not used anywhere as a unit of account for pricing, invoicing, accounting, wages, taxes, or any of the ways that monetary units are used that you know of. Neither is it widely used as a payment method, except for a small number of online stores, <clears throat> many of which trade in illegal goods, but not all. In the few exceptional cases where merchants accept Bitcoin as payment, it usually represents a negotiable percentage of their total, total, total turnover. What is more, the merchant typically sells the Bitcoin immediately so that they actually never receive the Bitcoin. That's not always true. It is therefore quite clear that the public has not adopted Bitcoin as a major medium of exchange, as a medium of exchange nor as a unit of account anywhere in the world that you know of. There is also no indication that this situation would be about to change in any significant way. The advertised story about Bitcoin as a currency is and remains fiction. Actually, that's not entirely true. I've been seeing plenty of evidence that OTC trading is getting more popular. Continuing on. 4.4 Central Bank Digital Currency the emergence of cryptocurrencies has pr prompted many to ask whether central banks should issue digital currencies. They already have. The question has re received particular attention in the Nordic countries, where cash is used less compared to most other parts of the world. The central banks of, of each Sweden, Finland, and Denmark have recently published discussion papers on the, on the topic. A central bank digital currency would be a claim on the digital on the central bank and hence a safe asset and convertible into other forms of central bank money. Spurgeous Riksbank 2017 emphasizes its its potential role as a small value payment instrument similar to cash which should be available at all times possibly even offline. Denmark's National Bank, National Bank 2017 point out that it would constitute a risk-free asset, but there are they are but are doubtful whether it would bear any technical similarities to cryptocurrencies. Grimm et al. 2017 consider universal access, suitability for small payments, and privacy to be relevant features. Absolutely. Beck and Garat, 2017, develop a taxonomy for various forms of money and theorize the existence of a central bank issued cryptocurrency. Their analysis shows that anonym anonymity of transactions is a consequence of using pe a peer-to-peer -peer network 
would be the key distinguishing feature of a central bank cryptocurrency compared to other forms of central bank money. A, a similar conclusion can be drawn from Dan, Danazi's Michael John, 2015, who presented a technical model for a central bank issued cryptocurrency. In their model, the infrastructure for a central bank cryptocurrency would be operated as a network, but there would be otherwise no difference to other forms of central bank money. The Taxonomy by Beck and Garrett, 2017, breaks down different forms of money based on four dimensions. The first is whether a form of money is widely available or only accessible to a limited group of counterparties. The second dimension is whether money is digital or physical. Thirdly, money can either be can be either issued by a central bank or commercial entity. As the final dimension, Beck and Garat, 2017, make a distinction between peer-to-peer -peer or token-based and account-based money. Using this taxonomy, all conceivable forms of money can be listed. One can, one can therefore imagine the existence of, say, a token-based digital widely available form of money issued by a central bank. This is what is often meant by a central bank digital currency. The problem with this definition is that no tokens actually exist in a digital environment. The dimension of, dig digital, the dimension of token based versus account based is therefore the same dimension as physical versus digital. An account based money is always digital and vice versa and vice versa. And a token based money is always physical and vice versa. The number of dimensions in Beck and Garat 2017 therefore actually reduces to three. In light of the analysis presented in this paper and consistent with the cited literature, central bank digital currency would constitute central bank accounts for the general public. The cash-like properties referred to in the literature narrow down to two features, anonymity and or privacy, and decentralized settlement. Anonymity and privacy of financial transactions may or may not be desired properties for a payment instrument, depending on one's point of view. Anonymity means the possibility to make a transaction without identifying oneself. Privacy means the possibility to make a transaction without anyone except the transacting parties knowing about it. Cash transactions are currently the only type of monetary transactions that can be made both privately and anonymously. It is questionable whether anonymity actually matters to most people. Uh, yeah, okay, whatever, dude. Esselink, uh, Esselink and Her Herandez 2017 have shown that anonymity is not important to users of cash in the Eurozone. Privacy may be more important than anonymity in most situations. <laughs> Dude, whatever. There's plenty of there's plenty of transactive activity going on in the eurozone that's private and and completely unknown to anybody else but the parties that are participating in it. Continuing on, <clears throat> privacy was one of the stated objectives for Nakamoto in 2018. Bitcoin transfers are made to and from addresses are, are made to and from addresses which are essentially random account numbers with no identifying information. The Bitcoin ledger is public, but it is difficult to identify the beneficiary for each account number. This means that Bitcoin does not provide perfect anonymity, but it also but it allows for a moderate degree of privacy. The normative question of whether or not or, or to what degree banking services and payments should be private I'm sorry the normative question of whether or to what degree or to what degree banking services and payments should be private is outside the scope of this paper it is noteworthy that legislation and international treaties have developed in the direction of less privacy whereas digital currencies seem to be striving towards more privacy. 
It is also important to note that ownership of an intangible asset is difficult to demonstrate and, legal, and legally defend unless the identity of the owner is reliably known. <laughs> Whatever. If you have it, the, if the keys, if you have the keys, it's yours. Continuing on, whether there are significant benefits in decentralizing a payments infrastructure any further from how it is operating today is doubtful. The concept has been explored to some extent. For example, by Leonin Leonin at all 2002, but has raised little enthusiasm before the emergence of cryptocurrencies. In any event, the technology to build decentralized payment systems has been available for far longer than cryptocurrencies have. The Bitcoin system has been built in a decentralized way for no reason other than to enable privacy. There is, however, the evident trade-off between efficiency and privacy, and the Bitcoin system is far slower and more costly to operate than any existing payment system, intentionally. Moreover, as Catalini et al. 2016 and Bohm 2015 have pointed out, it is questionable whether the Bitcoin system manages to remain decentralized as the power to govern the network is increasingly converging into the hands of a small number of large stakeholders. <laughs> the, the, there are plenty of things that can change that. Continuing on. Number 5. Conclusions The story of Bitcoin becoming an actual monetary unit is based on the false perception that money could exist in a single form, such as coins, with and without institutional backing. In reality, however, currency exists as both coins and banknotes, <clears throat> and has circulated alongside various forms of scriptural money throughout history. Replacing coins with a digital version does not mean other forms of money would go out of existence. I agree on that. What is more, currency can be seen as just another form of scriptural money, a kind of financial record-keeping device comparable to an account book. Money, in it, at its essence, is a unit of account. The concept of digital currency is therefore a fallacy, as currency cannot be digitized. When money is digital, it takes the form of account balances. Contrary to common, per common perception, cryptocurrencies do not enable direct peer-to-peer -peer transfers without intermediaries. That's not entirely true. Cryptocurrency systems use intermediaries, so-called miners, who maintain a ledger. The fact that miners are unidentified and randomly selected for each transaction does not mean interme intermediaries are not used. Cryptocurrencies, therefore, are essentially account systems for non-existent assets. <sighs> yeah. Um, without diving into all of the references he cited here, um, I think his, his concepts are a little bit flawed only because he's never actually... I, I don't think he's actually ever participated in any mining. And I think if he had... He would understand the issuance model a little more, and this this whole idea of whether or not Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies have "quote unquote" intrinsic value, that whole question would go away, because he would be seeing the intrinsic value on his fucking electricity bill. There we go. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. I think it's needed after that. Uh, we certainly slogged through that one. I mean, it was entertaining, and, and, and it was certainly enlightening to hear somebody else's perspective on money. However, I do believe that the the per person that was putting forward the paper, and I, I would have to go back and get his name again. Um, we can do that. This is the internet. Let's, where the fuck is it? Bank of Finland is going to fallacy. And I, I just closed the damn thing. Yeah, let's go ahead and bring it here. And who is the author? Um, uh, Griman Oleski. And that's, let's see, author Grime, comma, Oleski. Or Alexi. My apologies. Um, 
yeah, so as far as what they were trying to what they were trying to say concerning cryptocurrencies, I think they're 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 a little bit misguided in some of their concepts because they don't they don't honor the the user of the coins, tokens, currencies, money. They they don't honor them in what it, what creates value. <clears throat> And I, I think that's a, a miscalculation. See, they, we, we've lived in an economy where we've had dictated values. Okay, we've had values dictated to us from other entities. Entities that are not involved in the markets directly. That do not have direct skin in the game. And whose policies are simply being adhered to. Because those are the policies that you adhere to. But not to the not in actual response of the realities of the of the market bl- underlying it all, i.e., you. Cryptocurrencies exist because of waning confidence in the existing fiat currencies issued by central banks, and, and that that's a reality that a lot of people have have trouble internalizing. They have, they have trouble, you know, parsing that out. That Bitcoin was Satoshi Nakamoto saying, "Central banks, you have failed the people whose money and monetary value you have been managing for the last century or so. You have failed so badly that we are going to create our own way of transacting monetary value that does not involve you in any way, shape, or form." And that's why we have Bitcoin. And then Bitcoin itself started having trouble living up to that that concept. And it's because certain people came along and said, No, you will not have bigger than one megabyte blocks. I will make the world compete for that one megabyte of block space so that I can make people use their Bitcoin like Visa and give me all their Bitcoin because all of their Bitcoin will have to be transacted through my routing system because I have fucking miners, I, I have LN nodes all over the planet just waiting to be fired up when this thing goes into quote unquote production on the main net. And all these little bumpkins out there who think they're going to be raking in fees and shit, they're, they're just going to be kicked off the fucking network. I'm not going to take those unlicensed asshole, assholes on this fucking network, no. But that's that's the the route that that these two gentlemen or or lady and a gentleman or ladies or whoever you were who actually offered this, um, or authored rather. <laughs> Again, they didn't take into account you and and your participation in Bitcoin and what make and what makes it valuable is your your perception of your your participation in this network and your your valuing it versus your fiat currencies issued by your your nation state i mean i i find it really sad that you know year 9 into this thing we still have people d- telling us that values are to be dictated from top down the rules are going to be dictated from top down where Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that are proof of work demonstrate in no uncertain terms that this is not true. That these central entities are no longer necessary. Technology can actually replace them in your personal finance. And that scares the shit out of a lot of people. But here's the thing. None of our current financial infrastructure necessarily needs to be displaced or replaced a lot of it can be made more efficient with what we have now and yes efficiency does mean downsizing and and streamlining and all those neat euphemisms for firing people however however as long as we leave the ladder down and let other people determine their own rules for their own monetary units and distribute them freely and let the market decide how to value them 
then everything will be fine. But when we start putting up rules and licenses and regulations that say, oh, your cryptocurrency must be doing this and it must be going through our central bank or we can't, it can't happen and you, you need fucking licenses and you need insurance and you need... Uh, fuck you. Fuck you. I think that's the, the point that a lot of people are missing here. And I think I came up to this before, was that you are capable of being Jerome Powell. You, you, are, you are capable of being Janet Yellen, and Alan Greenspan, any of the people that came before them as, as head of the Federal Reserve. You, you can now do that. You can create a currency and distribute it, and if enough people like it, they will create a community that uses it as money. And if, another, if enough people outside of that network of people values it as money, they will exchange it for other forms of money too. And so you will no longer restricted to your central group of friends and this cryptocurrency that you've been distributing amongst others. You now have, if you've kept it open source, the potential to be expanding globally. This is what Bitcoin is really showing us. That this is possible. And yes, corruption is possible too. But that's only where you, you cease to actively participate and seek to find other proxies to participate in your stead. They will do so gladly, but not necessarily to your benefit. And this is something to keep in mind when you're deciding whether or not to assign a beneficiary or, or somebody to handle your funds for you. you know, and, th and this again is where regulation doesn't do us any favors because you and I, we, we talk to one another on Twitter and other social media, IRC and other places like that, and we say to one another things like, such and such exchanges acting weird, you need to get your money out now, and we do so. We react to it. <laughs> and often to our benefit. But we would not be getting that information as quickly as we do if not for those if not for those being the signals that we were monitoring. You know, we're monitoring these currencies directly. And we, we know when they're going goofy and we tell one another when they're going goofy. So you know, something to keep in mind. You account for something in all this. You are the market, after all. Let's go ahead and throw down just into a taste of music. Then we'll close out of here. Um, I've been feeling like it. A little bit of Slayer War Ensemble here on Coin Metal. And that was Strapping Young Lad with Oh My Fucking God. And it is with that that I'd like to close out this episode. I hope it was entertaining going through a monocular vision into the 21st century of digital finance. Hopefully the gentleman will start to participate and broaden his perspective and his horizons. But we can only hope. Thank you again for listening. I, I, I certainly do do appreciate the support i am working on releasing the last uh the last episode but haven't quite put that to video and up on youtube yet but it, it is it is finished and, and ready to ready to get there so expect that to be on my youtube channel soon along with previous episodes if you haven't caught them they are there for your listening pleasure anyway we will be back again on wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so until then, I'd like y'all to trade safe. Do your homework. Watch out for your own bunghole because nobody else is going to do it for you. Thank you again for listening. And as far as our last dance is concerned, I haven't actually picked anything out. So we're going to have to go to our ever-reliable 12-foot ninja. And if I can find it, here it is, One Hand Killing. Thank you again for listening, and you all have an excellent evening. <laughs>